The natural inclination of most mystics is to remain in undisturbed communion with God unknown to the world. And yet their lives can tell us more about God than can whole libraries on religion, philosophy and theology. They do not preach religion, sometimes they teach through silence and sometimes through only a few words. Those who are really seeking God will be drawn to these mystics as bees are drawn to sweet-smelling flowers. Swami Adhutananda, familiarly and affectionately known as Latu Maharaj, was a true mystic. Through the careful training and divine influence of his guru, Sri Ramakrishna, this unsophisticated village boy became an illumined saint. His brother disciple, Swami Vivekananda, once said, Latu is Sri Ramakrishna's greatest miracle. Having absolutely no education, he has attained the highest wisdom simply by virtue of the Master's touch. One Swami Turiyananda also said of him, Many of us had to go through the muddy waters of intellectual knowledge before we attained God, but Latu jumped over them like Hanuman. According to the Hindu epic Ramayana, Hanuman went to Sri Lanka to search for Sita by jumping over the ocean from India. His life teaches us how to live in God without touching the dirt of the world. To Latu's lack of formal education made him unique among Sri Ramakrishna's direct disciples. Perhaps because his mind was uncluttered by intellectualism and not trained to doubt, he absorbed the instructions of his guru with unquestioning simplicity. Once the master told him in an ecstatic mood, one day the gems of the Vedas and Vedanta will pour. Rakturam's uncle, although not as poor as his parents, had a tendency to spend beyond his means and this finally led him into debt. He was ultimately forced to sell his house and all his possessions to his creditors. Hoping to find a means of livelihood in the city, Rakturam and his uncle travelled several hundred miles to Calcutta on foot, arriving virtually destitute. Fortunately, they knew Fulchand, a village neighbour, who worked in the Calcutta office of Dr. Ramchandra Datta. Through this friend, Rakturam was hired as a servant in Ramchandra's house. Although the actual date of his arrival in Calcutta is not known, Rakturam was young when he came to the city. He proved to be an energetic and faithful servant. He did the household shopping, carried Ramchandra's lunch to his office, took the children to the park to play, and did all sorts of odd jobs around the home. Despite his busy schedule, he also used to find time for wrestling and other physical exercises. Rakturam had a natural frankness and honesty that were enhanced by his youth and lack of sophistication. Ramchandra came to trust him. Once a friend of Ramchandra suspected that Rakturam had stolen some coins from the household shopping money. Wanting to protect Ramchandra, the friend asked Rakturam, My boy, tell me honestly, how much did you pocket today? Rakturam retorted sharply, Sir, I am a servant, not a thief. The boldness of this reply offended the man and he complained to Ramchandra. But Ramchandra supported the boy and said, He is not a thief. Whatever he needs he asks from my wife. Seven first meetings with Sri Ramakrishna Rakturam became known as Latu in his new Calcutta surroundings and he was called by that name thereafter. Sri Ramakrishna with his village accent, would affectionately call him Latu or Noto. In later years, Swami Vivekananda, listening to Latu's words of wisdom, would address him playfully as Plato. In return, Latu would call Vivekananda by his premonastic name, Naran, but with his Bihari accent he pronounced it Loran. Sri Ramakrishna lived at the Dakshineswar Temple Garden, a few miles north of Calcutta on the eastern bank of the Ganges. After completing many years of spiritual practices, he began to long for devotees and disciples to whom he could give his teachings, the fruits of his realization. Gradually, the disciples began to gather. Ramchandra Datta, Latu's employer, 
was one of the first disciples to come to Sri Ramakrishna. Having a devotional nature, Ramchandra loved to speak about the Master, which enkindled Latu's passionate love for God. One day Latu heard Ramchandra repeating some of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, God sees into the mind of a man without concern for what he is or where he is. He who yearns for God and wants none other than God, to such a man God reveals Himself. One should call on Him with a simple and innocent heart. Without sincere longing, none can see God. One should pray to Him in solitude and weep for Him, only then will He bestow His mercy. Eight these words impressed Latu greatly, and he could sometimes be found lying covered with his blanket, quietly wiping tears from his eyes. However, he never told anyone why he was weeping. Latu eagerly waited for an opportunity to see Ramakrishna. One Sunday, either in late 1879 or early 1880, while Ramchandra was getting ready to go to Dakshineswar, Latu asked him, Would you take me with you? I want to see Sri Ramakrishna. Observing Latu's earnestness, Ramchandra agreed. When the master saw Latu, he asked Ramchandra, Ram, did you bring this boy with you? Where did you get him? I see some holy signs in him. Ramakrishna asked Latu to sit down and began to speak about ever-free souls. The knowledge of those who are ever-free souls only needs to be unveiled, as it were. They are like underground springs, which remain covered until a stonemason digging in the earth removes a particular rock. Then the water begins to flow. Saying this, he touched Latu, and the boy went into an ecstatic state. Tears trickled from his eyes, and his lips began to quiver with emotion. This continued for an hour. At last the master touched Latu, and he slowly returned to a normal state of consciousness. Nine Ramakrishna asked his nephew Ramlal to give some prasad to Latu and then sent him to visit the Kali temple. From the very beginning, the master recognized Latu's divinely pure nature, which he had verified by touching him. When Ramchandra and Latu were about to return to Calcutta, Ramakrishna said to the former, Please send Latu here from time to time. Latu's body returned to Calcutta, but his mind remained in Dakshineswar. After his first meeting with the Master, Latu began finding it difficult to work for Ramchandra with his earlier enthusiasm. After a few weeks, in February 1880, Ramchandra expressed a desire to send some sweets and fruits to the Master. Latu immediately said, Sir, I will carry your things to the Master. Latu walked six miles alone to Dakshineswar with sweets and fruits. He met the master on the garden path and bowed down to him, jubilant. He then visited the temple deities and returned to the master. When Sri Ramakrishna asked him to have lunch there, he declined. Because he was a strict vegetarian, he was afraid to eat the non-vegetarian meal in the temple dining hall. The master informed him that vegetarian prasad was available from the Vishnu temple and that prasad is always pure. However, Latu expressed a desire to eat the master's prasad. Ramakrishna smiled and told Ramlal, Look, this boy is so smart that he wants food from my share. When Ramakrishna had his lunch, he gave some food to Latu from his plate. Latu stayed at Dakshineswar the whole day and listened to the talks of the master with other devotees. In the evening when he was about to return to Calcutta, the master said, Don't go on foot. Take some coins from here and get a seat in a boat or carriage. Latu replied that he had coins, and he even jingled them in his pocket. The master smiled at Latu's guilelessness. Come again, said the master.10 after this second visit latu almost lost interest in his job but he continued to do his duties ramchandra and his wife observed the change in latu one day ramchandra mentioned this to ramakrishna the master told him 
It is understandable that Latu should act like this, for he longs to come here. Send him again sometime. Ramchandra sent Latu to Dakshineswar the next day. A doctor had just come to see Ramakrishna and had advised him to leave the Calcutta area for some time for a change of climate. This meant a visit to the village of Kamrapukur, the master's birthplace, 60 miles northwest of Calcutta. Seeing Latu, the master said, Latu, do not let your visits to this place, meaning himself, affect your work. Ram is giving you shelter, food, clothing, and whatever else you need. It is not right for you to shirk your duties in his house. Be careful that you are not ungrateful. At this reproof tears came to Latu's eyes. He said, I don't want to have a job anymore. I only want to stay here and serve you. But if you stay here, who will work for Ram's family? Answered Ramakrishna gently. Ram's family is my family also. Latu, now beginning to weep, replied, No, I shall never go back there again. I want to stay here, but I will not be here, said the master. I am going to Kamrapukur. When I return, then you can come. Unwillingly Latu returned to Calcutta. This time he had heard a beautiful teaching that the master had given to a devotee. It was also applicable to himself. Do all your household duties, but keep your mind in God. Serve your wife, son, father, mother as your very own, but always know that they are not yours. Though a maidservant works in her rich master's Swami Adhutananda times, 399 house, her mind is on her home and family in the country. She looks after her master's young children, saying to them, My Hari, my Ram, yet in her heart of hearts she knows that they are not hers. 11 Latu came to Dakshineswar to visit the master on another day, only to find that he had left for Kamrapukur. However, this news did not lessen his tremendous longing to see the master. He sat on the bank of the Ganges and started to weep. He had heard from someone that Sri Ramakrishna was ever present at Dakshineswar and that anyone who called on him would see him. Holding steadfastly to this idea, the boy sat there from midday until evening. Ramlal, the master's nephew, was employed as a priest in the Kali temple at that time. He noticed Latu in the temple garden. In his own words, as many times as I said to Latu, the master has gone home, so many times did he repeat, No, you do not understand, the master is definitely here. I found I could not convince the boy, so I went to the temple to conduct the Vesper service. When it was over, I returned to the spot where I had left Latu, taking with me some prasad for him to eat. There I discovered him bowing down and touching his forehead to the ground. Mystified, I kept quiet. After a moment or two, when the boy rose and saw me standing before him, he seemed surprised and asked me, Ah, where has the master gone? Dumbfounded, I gave him the prasad and went back to the temple twelve after eight long months, Shri Ramakrishna returned to Dakshineswar. One day Ramchandra again sent Latu to the temple garden with some fruits and sweets for the master. It was evening and Ramakrishna asked Latu to stay the night. After supper, at the master's request, Latu began to massage his feet. Kedarnath Chatterjee, a devotee who was there at the time, recalled the following conversation. Shri Ramakrishna asked Latu, Do you feel sleepy? Latu, No, sir. Master, are you afraid of anything? Latu, No, sir. Master, is your mind upset? Latu, No, sir. Master, are you sure you aren't sleepy? Latu, Yes, sir. Master, then why are your eyes like that? Latu, I don't know. After a while Latu began to weep. Ramakrishna asked, Why are you weeping? What has happened to you? Tell me. Then turning to Kedarnath, he said, Look at this boy. 
He is weeping and won't tell me anything. Kedarnath said, It is your play, sir. You have transmitted spiritual power to him and he is in an ecstatic mood. Latu stayed at Dakshineswar for three days. On the third day the master told him, Ram is getting worried about you. It is time for you to go home. Latu replied readily, My master won't be angry with me if I stay. He has already hired another servant who does all the work. What's that? responded the master. You are going to stay here and still receive a salary from Ram? If you are paid by someone, you must also work for him. I have never heard of anyone serving one person and taking money from another. Just at this point in the conversation, Ramchandra and his wife entered Sri Ramakrishna's room. The master turned to them and said, Look at this boy. When I say to him, Go home, he laughs and tells me, If I stay here, my master won't be angry. I don't want to leave. What is all this? Why should he stay here and forget his duties? Come now, Ram, you try to convince him of what I say. Sir, replied Ramchandra, you have turned this boy's head with your love. Now why are you giving me unnecessary trouble? Then the master said with a smile, What nectar has drawn this boy here? I know nothing of it. This time Latu returned to Calcutta. However, as much as Ramchandra's wife tried, she could not change his mind. I don't want to work here anymore, nor take any money from you, Latu stated assertively. Please tell Ram Babu that from now on I want to stay at Dakshineswar. Ramchandra's wife asked him, But who will feed and clothe you at Dakshineswar? I shall serve the master, replied Latu, and get prasad to eat from the temple there, and you will give me a cloth to wear. But if you are not working here, she pointed out, why should your master, Ramchandra, give you a cloth? Latu answered, why, Ram Babu loves me. Won't he give me a cloth? Ramchandra's wife laughed, marvelling at Latu's simplicity and guilelessness. 13 with Sri Ramakrishna in Dakshineswar in June 1881. Hriday a nephew of Ramakrishna who had served and attended him for many years, left Dakshineswar. Ramchandra immediately sent Latu to serve the master in his place. Two days later Ramchandra himself came to Dakshineswar and the master said to him, Permit this boy to stay here. He is a very pure soul. 14. Ramchandra willingly agreed. At Dakshineswar, Latu began a life of rigorous spiritual discipline under the Mastiff's guidance, coupled with continual service to him. He patterned his life on absolute obedience to his Guru. There are many incidents illustrating his uncompromising directness and fervor both in serving the Master and in his spiritual struggles. The Master once said to Latu, Be careful about wine and about lust and gold. These things are obstacles that create doubts about God. A person who meditates after taking intoxicants and a yogi who is attached to women are both hypocrites and only deceive themselves. Latu himself said later, One day I was going from Dakshineswar to Ram Babu's house in Calcutta. There was a wine shop at the Kos Sipore Road Junction and when I passed that place, my mind became restless, although I did not know why. When I returned to Dakshineswar, I told the master about it and he said, the odor of the wine caused restlessness in your mind. Avoid it from now on. Latu followed the master's instructions literally and one day Ramchandra spoke to the master about it, Sir, what have you asked Latu to do? In order to follow your advice, he walks 8 miles to Calcutta, the normal distance is 4 miles, by some roundabout route. The master said, I don't remember telling Latu to do such a thing. You asked him to avoid the smell of wine, said Ramchandra. As a result, not only will he not go near a shop where it is sold, 
he will not even walk down a street where such a shop is located. He takes some other route. Ramakrishna then told Latu, Latu, I asked you not to smell winf. I didn't forbid you to walk down the street where it is sold. It won't hurt you to pass near the shop. Remember this, pointing to his own body, and no intoxicant will be able to disturb you. Fifteen Latu would never begin the day without first seeing Ramakrishna and saluting him. One morning for some reason he did not see the master when he first woke up, so he shouted, Where are you? Wait a minute, I am coming, Ramakrishna answered. Latu kept his hands tightly pressed to his eyes until the master came. Then he took away his hands and bowed down to his feet. Another morning when he did not see the master right away, Latu again called for him to come to the room. But this time the master answered by asking Latu to come outside. Latu walked out on the western veranda and saw the master in the flower garden. Latu asked him, Sir, what are you doing? Yesterday a devotee brought a pair of sandals for you, answered the master, and I can find only one of them. A jackal may have taken the other, so I am looking for it. Latu said in a plaintive tone, Sir, please come here. Don't search for that sandal. 26. But I shall feel sorry if you can't wear these new sandals, replied the master, since it was only yesterday that the devotee brought them. Latu anxiously said, Sir, please stop. If you keep looking for my sandal, it will be harmful for me. My whole day will be spent in vain. The disciple is expected to serve the Guru. The reverse is not only unusual, but is even considered inauspicious for the disciple. Ramakrishna responded, Do you know what day is really spent in vain? That day when the Lord's name is not chanted, 16, as Latu had received no formal schooling, Ramakrishna hoped that he might acquire at least a rudimentary education, so he tried to take him through the Bengali alphabet himself. Showing him the first few letters, the master carefully gave Latu their proper pronunciation and asked him to repeat them. But Latu was from Bihar, and his pronunciation was quite different from that of a Bengali. Ramakrishna corrected him repeatedly with much amusement, but the result was always the same. Both the master and Latu began to laugh, and the lesson was stopped for that day. The experiment continued for three days after which Ramakrishna gave up in despair and told Latu, No more book learning for you, 17 thus ended Latu's education. Sri Ramakrishna always stressed the necessity of harmonizing the various paths to God. At one time he told a group of disciples, Don't be one-sided. Our attitude towards the Lord must be symphonic in nature, made up of many instruments. It is a feast of many dishes. The Master took great pains to develop this ideal in the lives of His young disciples. He led them through the four yogas, the paths of discrimination, devotion, unselfish action and meditation. At the same time, He would select a particular yoga most suitable to the temperament of an individual disciple and recommend that path in order to awaken the disciple's spiritual energy. Sri Ramakrishna knew that Latu was of an emotional nature, therefore he encouraged him to take part in Kirtan, devotional singing. The following incident was related by Ramlal. One day some devotees from Konagar came to Dakshineswar and began to sing the Lord's name in the Master's presence. The Master and Latu joined in the singing. It was the first time that I had seen Latu join in a group such as this. He was seated in a kamar, but when the master called him, he at once came forward and soon started to dance. In time, however, he became tired and lay down. The master saw this and began to sing Ram Nam, the glorious name of Lord Rama, as he danced around Latu's prostrate body. Never before had I heard the Master sing Ram Nam so sweetly. 
one of the devotees from Konagar became overwhelmed by the mood of the singing and, with great emotion, fell at the master's feet. Eighteen Latu was always eager to serve his guru. One day he learned that the master had expressed a wish to have a picture of Sri Chaitanya for his room, and the next day he went to Ramchandra in Calcutta to obtain one. When the master saw the new picture in his room, he asked, Did Ram mind your asking for this picture? Did you ask for it in my name? No, replied Latu, I didn't mention your name. I simply asked him for a picture of Chaitanya. Oh, indeed, said the master. And what was his reply? He advised me to go to mother, Ramchandra's wife, and ask for one. Good, said the master. You should never ask for anything in my name. 19. According to the scriptures, it is not good for yogis to accept gifts. This frees the yogi from being influenced by the giver and also from any obligation to him. One night Latu was fanning the master. He had worked hard all day and felt drowsy, but despite his sleepiness, his service to the master did not slacken. Observing this, the master asked him half jokingly and half seriously, Latu, can you say whether God sleeps or not? The question surprised Latu and he answered that he didn't know. Then, more seriously, the master continued, Everyone in the world sleeps, but God does not, for if God slept, the universe would be plunged into darkness and would dissolve. God must remain awake day and night taking care of His creatures, so that they can sleep without fear. Latu was amazed. Do you mean that God takes care of His creatures while they are sleeping, and that they accept service from Him, their Creator? Yes, said the Master, that is right. He lulls His creatures to sleep and stays awake to watch over them, 21 incident in particular reveals Latu's direct and uncompromising approach to spiritual life. He fell sound asleep early one evening at Dakshineswar. Ramakrishna noticed his disciple sleeping and not only woke him, but rebuked him sharply, If you sleep in the evening, when will you meditate? You should meditate so deeply that the night passes unnoticed. Instead, your eyelids are heavy with sleep at this auspicious time. Did you come here only to sleep? That was enough. The master's scolding caused a veritable upheaval in Latu's mind. In his own words, how can I express the deep sorrow that seized me at the master's words? What a wretch Elam said to myself, that having the rare blessing of such holy company, I should be wasting my time. I started to whip my mind. Mercilessly, I splashed water on my eyes and began to walk briskly along the bank of the Ganges. When my body became overheated, I returned and sat near him. Again I dozed, and again I went out for a walk. Thus I fought the whole night. The struggle continued the next night also. It was a terrible fight. Sleep would overcome my eyes during the day, but I did not give up. The battle went on day and night. Finally, night sleep came under control, but not day sleep. Asterisk after two years of struggle, Latu conquered sleep and never again slept at night. Swami Sardananda wrote, Latu was invariably seen praying and meditating the whole night and sleeping during the day. His life was a literal example of the teaching of the Gita, TN that which is night to all beings, the man of self-control is awake, and where all beings are awake, there is night for the sage who sees. 2.69.21 He who has controlled the tongue, has controlled all other senses, says the Bhagavata. In the early days at Dakshineswar, Latu used to wrestle and had a large appetite. One day he went to a devotee's house in Calcutta and ate an exceptional quantity of food. The next day in front of the master that devotee praised Latu's power of consuming food. Later, the master told Latu privately, Look, 
it is not good to eat excessively by competing with others. During lunch, you may eat as much as you wish, but at night, don't eat too much. Latu obeyed his master's advice. Gradually, he reduced his meals to such an extent that his body became emaciated. The master observed this and told Latu, Look, you have gone to the other extreme. Please eat the amount that will keep your body in fit condition. Otherwise, if you eat too little, you won't be able to focus your mind during meditation. 22 Brahmacharya, or continence, is indispensable in spiritual life. Ramakrishna told his disciples, When a man succeeds in the conservation of his sexual energy, his intellect reflects the image of Brahman, even as a glass gives a perfect image when its back is painted with mercury solution. The man who carries this image of Brahman in his heart is able to accomplish everything. He will succeed wonderfully in whatever action he engages himself. 23 Sri Ramakrishna advised his householder disciples to lead a normal family life while practicing self-control. But the master cautioned those who wanted to become monks to be careful about women. He told Latu, if you want to realize God, you will have to be a Brahmacharin. Without practicing Brahmacharya or continence, one cannot concentrate steadily on God. From Brahmacharya comes intellectual conviction and then comes faith in the power of Brahman. Without this faith, one cannot feel that he lives in Brahman. Practice Japam and meditation day and night. This is the way one can get rid of attachment for lust and gold. 24 Sri Ramakrishna was extremely frugal and did not approve of his disciples' extravagance. Latu recalled, once in Dakshineswar the master asked a devotee to light the oil lamp in his room. The devotee used four matchsticks, yet still couldn't light the lamp. The master then got down from his cot and lighted the lamp himself. He said to the devotee, Hello, the householders save their hard-earned money and give it to the monks. Is it proper to misuse their money? Another day I was about to use a match stick to ignite his tobacco and he scolded me, Go to the kitchen and get fire from there, 25. It is amazing how Sri Ramakrishna used small things to teach his disciples. One day after the midday meal, the master asked Rakhal to prepare some betel rolls. Betel is chewed after meals in India. Rakhal replied that he did not know how to make betel rolls. How strange, said the master. Does one have to be trained as an apprentice to learn to make betel rolls? Go and prepare some and bring them here. Rakhal did not make a move. This annoyed Latu. He told Rakhal, What is the matter with you? Won't you do what he says? And you are arguing with him. You are not behaving properly. Latu's angry words provoked Rakhal, who blurted out, If you think that is so, why don't you go and do it yourself? I won't do it. I have never made a betel roll in my life. By this time Latu's anger had reached a high pitch and he went on saying many things inarticulately in his half Ben Gali and half Hindi language. The master enjoyed the commotion and called his nephew Ramlal. Come and see the fun. Just see the fight between these two. Then he added, Well, Ramlal, tell me who is the greater devotee, Rakhal or Latu? Ramlal understood the point and said, I think Rakhal is the greater of the two. This remark threw Latu into a fit of rage and he stammered out, Ah, what a verdict! He disobeyed the master and yet he is a greater devotee. Latu's fury made the master laugh and he said, You are right, Ramlal. Yes, Rakhal's devotion runs higher. Just see how easily he is smiling and talking. Pointing to Latu he added, and how terribly angry he is. A real devotee can he show anger before the Lord. Anger is satanic. Anger makes love and devotion take wing. Latu was cut to tire quick. 
He was filled simultaneously with shame and pike, and tears came to his eyes. He said to the master, I will never again be angry before you. Please forgive me, 26 religion means realization of God. Ordinary teachers teach religion, but teachers like Buddha, Christ or Ramakrishna could give religion. Years later, Brahmananda narrated how the Master roused Latu's spiritual consciousness one day. Following the Master's instructions, Latu woke us one particular morning for meditation. It was not yet dawn. After washing quickly, we sat down to do japam. The Master said to us, Dive deep today, repeating the Lord's name with devotion. Then he began to sing, Wake up, O Mother Kundalini wake up and went around and around us. He continued as we did our japam. All of a sudden, without any apparent cause, my whole body shook violently. At the same time, Latu uttered a cry. The master placed his hands on Latu's shoulders and held him, saying, Don't get up. Stay where you are. I could see that Latu was feeling great pain but the master refused to let him get up. After some time, I saw that Latu had lost normal consciousness. The master was still singing the same song and continued singing it for more than an hour. Thus, even through songs, he would transmit spiritual power to us. 27 Ramakrishna knew the tendencies of his disciples and would send them to different temples or spots in the temple garden of Dakshineswar to practice meditation. Ramlal told the following story. One day at noon the master sent Latu to one of the Shiva temples to meditate. Late afternoon came and Latu still had not appeared, so the master sent me to see about him. When I entered the temple, I saw Latu sitting motionless, deep in meditation and bathed in perspiration. When I told the master what I had seen, he himself went to the temple, taking a fan with him. He asked me to bring a glass of water. When I entered, I saw the master fanning Latu. Latu began to tremble. The master said, My boy, it is twilight. When will you set the lamps and light them? At the sound of the Master Seven S voice, Latu slowly began to regain consciousness. He opened his eyes and seemed puzzled to see the Master before him. You have perspired a great deal, the Master said. Rest a bit more before you leave your seat. By this time Latu was fully conscious of what was going on. What are you doing, sir? he cried. Won't this disgrace me? It is I who should be serving you. With great affection the master said, No, my boy, it is not you I am serving, but the Lord Shiva inside you. He was uncomfortable in such unbearable heat. Did you know that he had entered you? Latu replied, No, I knew nothing. I was gazing at the lingam the image of Shiva, and saw a wonderful light. I remember only that the light flooded the whole temple. After that I lost consciousness, 28 Ramakrishna used to describe the signs of a man who is advanced in meditation, birds will settle on his head, taking him to be some inert thing, a snake will glide over his body and he will not know it, his meditation will continue without a break in all circumstances, with eyes shut or open, while talking or walking or engaged in any work. The elder Gopal, another disciple of the Master, related this incident. One day Latu was meditating on the bank of the Ganges. He used to choose a seat above the level to which the water rose during flood tide. However, that day the water rose unusually high, up to where he was sitting in meditation and continued rising. Latu was so absorbed that he did not feel the water. I anxiously reported the matter to the master. He came hurriedly, waded out to where Latu was and brought him back to normal consciousness. 29. Another day during meditation, Latu lost outer consciousness, 
fell flat on his face and began to make a noise. The elder Gopal noticed this and immediately informed the master. Sri Ramakrishna rushed to Latu and helped him to lie down on his back. He then put his knee on his chest and began to massage him. Gradually Latu returned to a normal state of consciousness. The master asked, Haven't you seen Mother Kali today? Don't talk about it. If you speak out, people will create a furor here. Latu kept quiet. From then on, whenever Latu meditated, his eyes, face and chest turned red. Thirty-one night the master said to his young disciples, What is the matter with you? Have you come here to sleep? He then gave specific instructions to each disciple and sent them to different places in the temple garden. Ramakrishna sent Latu to the Beltala, where he had practiced Tantric Sadhana. At midnight, Latu became immersed in deep meditation and could not move from his seat. In the morning, Ramakrishna did not find his attendant in his room, so he went to look for him in the Beltala. He found Latu there, guarded by two dogs as he meditated. Slowly Latu regained outer consciousness, saw the master in front of him and bowed down to him. While returning to his room, the master said to Latu, One saw two Bhinus, guardian spirits, protecting you disguised as two dogs. You are very fortunate. The Divine Mother sent those spirits to protect you. While he was in the temple one evening, Latu found that he could not meditate, he returned to the master's room feeling discouraged. The master asked, Why have you come back so soon? One couldn't concentrate my mind on Japan. Why not? I don't know, answered Latu. On other days when I sit for Japam and meditation, I see something and the mind gets concentrated. But today nothing appeared. I tried hard to concentrate, but I failed. He added, On my way to the temple the thought came to me, if mother would appear to me and offer a boon, what should I ask for? Immediately the master said, There is the trouble. Can one do Japam with the mind full of desires? Never let that happen again. When sitting to meditate, one should not ask for anything. If mother ever insists on giving you something, then ask only for devotion to her. Never ask for wealth, power, sense pleasures, or anything else. 32 Latu was extremely fortunate that he got the opportunity to live with Ramakrishna and serve him for over six years. Sri Ramakrishna taught Latu various spiritual disciplines. One day while Latu was massaging Ramakrishna's feet, the master asked, Do you know what your Lord Rama is doing now? Latu was dumbfounded and kept quiet. The master said, Your Lord Rama is now passing an elephant through the eye of a needle. Latu understood that Ramakrishna, out of compassion, was pouring spirituality into him. Later, Latu reminisced, Did you know that the Master snatched me from the snares of the world? I was an orphan. He flooded me with love and affection. If he had not accepted me, I would have been like an animal, spending all my days working like a slave. My life would have been worth nothing. I am an unlettered man. He used to tell me, Always keep your mind spotless. Don't allow impure thoughts to enter it. If you find such desires tormenting you, pray to God and chant His name. He will protect you. If the mind still will not remain calm, then go to the temple of the mother and sit before her. Or else come here, pointing to himself. Dot 33 Latu was quite outspoken, but the master taught him to be humble and not to hurt anyone. Once at Dakshineswar a devotee did not behave well and Latu got irritated and scolded him harshly. The master observed everything. When the devotee left, Ramakrishna told Latu, It is not good to speak harshly to those who come here. They are tormented with worldly problems. 
if they come here and then are scolded for their shortcomings, where will they go? In the presence of holy company never use harsh words to anyone and never say anything to cause pain to another. Tomorrow you go to him and apologize so that he may forget what you said to him today. So the next day Latu visited the devotee with his pride humbled. He spoke to him sweetly. When he returned, the master asked, Did you offer him my salutations? Amazed at his words, Latu said that he had not. Then the master said, Go to him again and offer him my salutations. So again Latu went to that devotee and conveyed Ramakrishna's times 409 salutations. At this the devotee burst into tears. Latu was moved to see him weeping. When he returned this time the master said, Now your misdeed is pardoned. Thirty-four Sarada Devi, Holy Mother, used to live in the Nahabat concert tower at Dakshineswar, where she cooked for the master and for the devotees. The master knew that she was alone and needed some help. One day, seeing Latu meditating on the bank of the Ganges, Ramakrishna said to him, Look here, Latu, the one on whom you are meditating is now sweating over the flower. Evidently the master meant Sarada Devi, whom he regarded as identical with the Divine Mother Kali. Latu had been meditating on Kali. He then took Latu to the Nahabat and said to Holy Mother, This boy is a pure soul. He will knead the flour and flatten the chapati for you. Whenever you need any help, please ask him. 35 Thus Latu became a member of Holy Mother's household. It was great fun to live with Sri Ramakrishna. Not only was he a spiritual guide to his disciples, but he would also join them in picnics go to the theatre with them or watch their frivolous games, as M. described in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. The devotees were engaged in a game of Golakdham. This is a game in which the player tries to get to heaven by passing through different planes, but with each false step he falls into a particular hell. Hajra joined them. The master stood by, watching them play. M and Kishori reached heaven. Sri Ramakrishna bowed before them and said, Blessed are you two brothers. He said to M, aside, don't play anymore. Hajra fell into hell. The master said, What's the matter with Hajra? Again, no sooner had Hajra got out of hell than he fell into it again. All burst into laughter. Latu, at the first throw of the dice, went to heaven from earth. He began to cut capers of joy. See Latu's joy, said the master. He would have been terribly sad if he hadn't achieved this. This too has a meaning. Hajra is so vain that he thinks he will triumph over all even in this game. This is the law of God that he never humiliates a righteous person. Such a man is victorious everywhere. 36 On 14th December 1883 Ramakrishna told Latu and other devotees the story of a little boy named Jatila who was afraid to go to school through the forest. But his poor mother made him go and told him to call on brother Madhusudan, Krishna, for help. Whenever Jatila called on Krishna, he appeared before the boy and escorted him in the forest. This story created a tremendous longing in Latu's mind. He realized that God answers sincere prayer. M. recorded in the Gospel, at three o'clock in the morning M. left his seat. He proceeded toward the Panchavati. Suddenly he heard a distant sound, as if someone were wailing piteously. Oh, where art thou, brother Madhusudan? The light of the full moon streamed through the thick foliage of the Panchavati, and as he proceeded he saw at a distance one of the master's disciples, Latu, sitting alone in the grove, crying helplessly, Oh, where art thou, brother Madhusudan? Silently M. watched him, 37. The grace of the Guru was Latu's only refuge. 
He did not read any books, but day and night he saw the blazing life of his master and heard his teachings. Once he said, I saw the master in Samadhi many times, but one day I saw his beautiful unique form. His body complexion was changed and his face radiated fearlessness and compassion. I shall never forget that form of the Master, 38 on 3rd August 1884 Latu and M. both had the opportunity to see the Master's divine form, about which M. recorded in the Gospel, presently the Master left them, going in the direction of the pine trees. After a few minutes M. and Latu, standing in the Panchavati, saw the Master coming back toward them. Behind him the sky was black with the rain cloud. Its reflection in the Ganges made the water darker. The disciples felt that the Master was God incarnate, a divine child five years old, radiant with the smile of innocence and purity. The presence of this God-man charged the trees, shrubs, flowers, plants and temples with spiritual fervor and divine joy. 39. When God incarnates as a human being, He behaves accordingly. Like other human beings, He has hunger and thirst, suffering and sickness, and at the same time He can transcend body consciousness at any time. Once the Master had an accident in Dakshineswar, and His arm was broken. Dr. Madhusudan set it with a splint and put a bandage around it. Latu served the Master day and night. When the devotees came to see Ramakrishna, he jokingly said to them, Hello, Ram says that I am an avatar. What do you say? Have you ever heard that an avatar's arm had been broken? Latu recalled. Sometime after the Master hurt his arm, Tarak came to Dakshineswar from Vrindavan. When he noticed the bandage on the Master's arm, he asked, what happened to your arm? The master replied, I was going to take a look at the moon when my feet tripped over a low railing and my arm was broken. The suffering has not stopped. Is it a dislocation or a fracture? Tarak asked. I don't know, said the master. These people have simply bandaged my arm. I like to chant the mother's name with my mind at ease but just see the trouble now. They won't even let me undo the bandage. Is it possible to call on the mother in such a painful state? Sometimes I think, what nonsense this bandage is. Let me break all these bonds and merge in the divine. Then again I think, no, this is just another aspect of the divine play. There is also some joy in this. Tarak told the Master, By your mere wish you can be cured. What? exclaimed Ramakrishna. Can I cure myself by only a wish? Then he paused a moment and added, No. Suffering from this affliction is good, for those who come here with desires will see the condition I am in and will go away. They won't bother me. Then he said, Mother, you played a clever trick. At that he started to sing. Soon he went into Samadhi.40 At Shampukur and Kosipore. In the middle of 1885 Ramakrishna's throat became sore. This was the first indication of cancer. To conveniently treat him, the devotees moved Ramakrishna from Dakshineswar to Shampukur in North Calcutta. Latu was his personal attendant, so he went with him. Between his duties, Latu continued his spiritual disciplines and quite often experienced ecstasy. Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar, an eminent scientist, was the master's physician. He believed spiritual ecstasy to be a kind of nervous debility. On 25th October 1885, Narendra sang a few devotional songs to the master when Dr. Sarkar was present. M. later recorded. A strange transformation came over the devotees. They all became mad, as it were, with divine ecstasy. The younger Narun and Latu went into deep samadhi. The atmosphere of the room became electric. Everyone felt the presence of God.
Master, you have just noticed the effect of divine ecstasy. What does your science say about that? Do you think it is a mere hoax, Doctor? I must say that this is all natural when so many people have experienced it. It cannot be a hoax. 41 Ramakrishna stayed at Shampukur for three months and then moved to Kosipore on 11th December 1885. Gradually the master's body became weak, making it impossible for him to walk to the toilet. He asked Latu to clean his commode. With great joy Latu replied, Master, whatever you will order me to do, I will do. I am your sweeper and servant. Forty-two later, Latu reminisced about the Kosipore days, serving the Master was our worship. We didn't need any other spiritual disciplines. The Master taught us, during worship, one should think that his chosen deity is in front of him. You are washing his feet, bathing him, decorating him, feeding him, and placing him in your heart, offering flowers at his feet. At Kosipore we did that to the Master, 43. In the early part of 1886 the elder Gopal expressed a desire to distribute 12 ochre cloths and 12 rosaries to some monks in the area. The Master said to him, Offer those cloths and rosaries to these young disciples. Each one of them is equivalent to a thousand monks. Gopal handed them over to the master and he gave one ochre cloth and a rosary to Latu and the remaining ones to others. 44 Latu earlier had had various kinds of spiritual experiences such as ecstasy and visions of divine forms or light but he experienced the highest samadhi at Kosipore. He later narrated to a devotee, You see, it is nothing spectacular to see light during meditation, it only strengthens faith. When body consciousness goes away and the mind becomes pure, one realizes a realm behind the light, which neither can be known through the intellect nor can it be expressed by words. One day at Kos Sipore I was rubbing the master's head, then that transcendental realm opened to me. My senses failed to grasp that infinite, but I realized it through and through. Forty-five Shashi later testified, one day the master asked Latu to rub his head. After a while I noticed that Latu's hand stopped, his body became motionless and he was absorbed in deep meditation. I called him a couple of times and even touched his body, but did not get any response. The master said to me, don't disturb him. Is his mind in this world? Then without disturbing Latu, I began to rub the master's head. 46 Sri Ramakrishna passed away on 16th August 1886. Latu vividly described that day and the days that followed. Every night, just before going to bed, the master would say, Hari Om Tat Sat, verily, the Lord is the only reality, dot. That last night he uttered this as I was fanning him. It was nearly 11 p.m. Then he heaved a sigh and seemed to go into Samadhi. Brother Loren asked us to chant Hari Om Tat Saturday. We continued to chant until 1 a.m., when the master came down from Samadhi. Then he ate a little farina pudding which Shashi fed him. Suddenly, he went into Samadhi again. Seeing this, Loren grew worried. He called Gopal Dada and asked him to get Ramlal Dada. Gopal Dada and I left immediately for Dakshineswar and Ramlal Dada came back with us. He examined the master and said, the crown of his head is still warm. Please call Captain Vishwanath UPA Dhyaya, the resident of the Nepal's government in Calcutta and a devotee of the Master. Holy Mother was unable to restrain herself. When she came to the Master's room, she cried, O oh Mother Kali, what have I done that you have left us? Seeing the Mother weeping, Baburam and Jogin went up to her and Golapma took her to her room. Shortly after that captain arrived. He asked us to rub the master's body with ghee, clarified butter. 
Shashi rubbed his body and Vakuntha massaged his feet, but it was to no avail. Early that morning Dr. Mahendra, Mahendralal Sarkar, came to examine the master and said, he has given up the body. In the meantime, the Calcutta devotees had received the news and one after another they began to arrive. A photograph, actually two, was taken of the master with the devotees. By that time it was afternoon. The master's body remained on a cot, beautifully decorated, until it was carried to the cremation ground at Kosipore. Ram Babu told me to stay at the garden house until Akshay Babu returned from the cremation ground. So I stayed there while the others went. Only once did I hear Holy Mother weeping, after that she was silent. Never have I seen a woman with such strength. That night I went to the cremation ground. I saw many people sitting quietly on the bank of the Ganges. Shashi was near the funeral pyre with a fan in his hand, and Sharat was with him. Both Sharat and Loren sought to console Shashi. I took him by the hand and tried to lift his spirits a little, but he remained motionless with grief. Then Shashi collected the ashes and bones of the master and put them in an urn. He placed the urn on his head and carried it to the garden house, where it was kept on the master's bed. 47 The disciples continued to worship Ramakrishna's relics. However, Ramchandra wanted to enshrine the relics of the master at his garden house at Kankurgachi and establish a monastery there. Some disciples refused to accept this idea. Narendra settled the matter by sharing some of the relics with Ramchandra, who installed them at Kankurgachi on Krishna's birthday, 23rd August 1886. Latu attended that consecration ceremony. 48 Pilgrimage to Vrindavan on 30th August 1886. Holy Mother left for pilgrimage along with Lakshmi, Ramakrishna's niece, Golapma, M.S. wife, Kali, Jogin, and Latu. They first stopped at Deoghar to visit the temple of Lord Shiva and then went to Varanasi. Latu met Swami Bhaskarananda, a well-known scholar and monk, who told him, don't waste your time roaming about, sit down in one place and call on him. Then you are sure to get the Lord's grace. 49 The party stayed three days at Varanasi and then after spending one day at Ayodhya, the birthplace of Sri Rama, they went to Vrindavan. Balaram Basu, a devotee of the Master, arranged for their stay in his retreat house. Latu visited different temples of Vrindavan with the Holy Mother. At Vrindavan, there were no fixed times for Latu's meals. He would come at odd hours to Mother or her companions and ask for something to eat. Sometimes he would feed the monkeys his own bread and would ask for more food. The other women were understandably annoyed by this, but the mother was forgiving and never scolded him for his childlike behavior. She asked her companions to keep Latu's meals well, covered in a certain place so that he might come at any time and take his meals as he liked. Sometimes Latu would disappear for a few days, which caused anxiety to Holy Mother but suddenly he would appear again and inform her that he had been on the bank of the Jamuna. His unusual manner of living was not controlled by any rules or routine. At Barnagore Monastery After Sri Ramakrishna's passing away, Narendra Akendi some of the other disciples established the first Ramakrishna Monastery at Barnagore, which is between Calcutta and Dakshineswar, and is very close to the Ganges where the master's body was cremated. The rent was very low because it was an old, dilapidated building, and it had the reputation of being haunted. In January 1887, Narendra and some other disciples took formal monastic vows. At Barnagore Monastery they studied the scriptures, practiced severe austerity and meditation, and thus prepared themselves to be world teachers. Either in the last part of January or in early February 1887, 
Holy Mother heard that Ramchandra's daughter had died in a fire and she immediately sent Latu to Calcutta to his previous employer. He stayed there for a few days and then went to the Barnagore monastery. As some disciples had already taken monastic vows, Vivekananda asked Latu to also take vows. Latu agreed at once. According to custom, before the sannyasa ceremony one performs one's own shraddha ceremony, funeral rites, thus severing all ties with the world and ensuring liberation for one's family. During the shraddha ceremony, Latu followed his own unconventional method. Instead of repeating the Sanskrit mantras, he simply evoked his departed ancestors in his own guileless way and offered food and other articles to them, saying, Father dear, do come here, take your seat, accept my worship, take this food and drink, and so on. Swami Adhutananda Times 415 Latu's whole life was extraordinary. His single-minded approach to God was wonderful in every way, and he was unique among the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. Vivekananda therefore gave him the monastic name Swami Adhutananda, meaning, he who finds bliss in the wonderful nature of the Atman. Henceforth we shall call him Latu Maharaj instead of Latu or Adhutananda, as he is well known by that name. Maharaj is a term of respect commonly used in addressing a monk. After he became a sannyasin, Latu Maharaj stayed at Barnagore Math Monastery for a year and a half. In later years, he would tell many stories about the early days at the monastery. Shashi's performance of the Vesper service was something worth seeing. Everybody could palpably feel the Master's presence. Brother Kali, Abhedananda, composed the mantras for the Master's worship and ever since then the worship has been conducted with these mantras. In those days we loved each other so dearly that if perchance someone got angry with someone else, that anger did not last long. Very often our topic of conversation would be the Master's transcendent love. If one person said, he used to love me the most, another would at once contradict him and say, no, he loved me the most. One day during such a discussion I told them, the master did not leave any property behind and still your squabbling seems unending. The Lord alone knows whether you would have gone to court if he had left any property. There was an outburst of laughter at my remark. I noticed that everyone at the math was studying hard. One day I asked Brother Sharat, Sardananda, why do you read so many books? All of you are finished with school, yet you study so hard. Are you to appear for an examination? Sharat replied, Brother, without serious study how are we to understand the subtle matters of religion? I rejoined that the Master had talked so much about these subtle matters and I had never seen him reading books. Sharat said, his case is completely different. He himself said that the Divine Mother used to provide him with heaps of knowledge. Have we reached that stage, or can we ever hope to reach it? We have to read in order to acquire such knowledge. I did not leave the matter there, but replied, the Master said that we get one conception of the truth through studying books and quite another by spiritual experience. Then Sharat said, but didn't he say that those who would be teachers will have to study the scriptures as well? Then I realized that men understand differently according to their mental constitutions and that the Master taught each one according to his own nature. From then on I kept quiet.50 recalling the days at Barnagore Math, Swami Ramakrishnananda spoke of the intensity of Latu Maharaj's meditation, we often had to call Latu back to normal consciousness and virtually force him to take food. There were many days when we called him again and again but with no response, so we would place his food in his room and leave. The rest of the day would pass. When we went to call him for supper, we would find the noon meal still where it had been placed, 
untouched and stale, and Latu lying down in the same straight posture as before, completely covered with a thick cotton chadar. We had to resort to many tricks just to force a little food down his throat. 51 Thus a mystic transcends body consciousness through love and longing for God. Once Swami Sardananda told Mahendranath Datta how Latu Maharaj would pass the night at Barnagore. You see, at night that rascal Latu doesn't sleep at all. During the first part of the night he pretends to be asleep and even snores. But he keeps his rosary with him, and when the others are asleep, he sits up and starts counting his beads. One night I heard the ticking of beads, and thought a mouse might have come in the room. When I gave a rap, the sound stopped. A little later, the ticks began again. This went on for a while, and I began to suspect that it might not be a mouse. The next night I stayed awake and was very watchful. The moment I heard the first tick, I struck a match and found Latu sitting up, counting his beads. Then I laughed, ah, you mean to surpass us all. While we are sleeping, you are counting your beads, fifty to a monk does not respect another monk if he lacks spirituality. From the following stories told by Swami Turiyananda, it is clear that he had great regard for Latu Maharaj. Many of the brother monks were leaving the monastery at Barnagore to practice austerity. I too felt an urge to meet holy men in other places of India. As I was thinking this over, a voice said from within me, Where will you find such a sadhu as he? Startled, I turned my gaze and saw Latu Maharaj lying down covered with a thick cloth, deep in meditation. Immediately the thought came, where, indeed, will I find a sadhu like him? The very same moment Latu Maharaj spoke out. Where will you go? It is better to engage yourself in tapasya here. That time I stayed at the monastery. Another day in the course of conversation on spiritual things I remarked, the Lord is free from faults such as partiality, cruelty and the like. Latu Maharaj did not say anything then, but after the gentleman to whom I was talking had gone, he said, What a statement you made! You mean that the Lord is like a little child and you, like a mother, have to go to his defense? I tried to vindicate myself and said, if he did whatever came to his mind, he would be a capricious despot. Is he like the Tsar of Russia? He is kind and benevolent. Latu Maharaj blinked and said, It is very good of you to save your Lord from criticism. But won't you admit that even the despotic Tsars are guided by him? What a wonderful light he threw on the issue. His words remained with me as if they had been chiseled permanently in stone. 53 days of austerity if a man worships me, says Krishna in the Gita, and meditates upon me with an undistracted mind, devoting every moment to me, I shall supply all his needs. 9.22 Latu Maharaj surrendered himself to Sri Ramakrishna wholeheartedly. After the Master's passing away, he went through various kinds of sadhanas, he explained, it is he who is taking me by the hand through all these disciplines. From 1886 to 1912, when he moved permanently to Varanasi, Latu times Maharaj lived almost entirely in the Calcutta area, not far from the places where Ramakrishna had stayed and often visited. Yet even in the city he lived the life of a wandering monk, unattached to people or places. Until 1903, when he took up residence at Balaram Basu's house, there was no one place that he called home. Sometimes he stayed at the homes of various householder devotees of the Master, but most often he could be found living simply on the bank of the Ganges. He would get food, a few cons, or minimal necessities from different devotees, and they in turn felt blessed to serve this holy man. Sometimes he stayed at the Alambazar Monastery and then the Belur Monastery. 
द रामा कृष्णा मैथ वॉज मूव फ्रॉम बर्नागोरे टू अलम्बजर इन एटीन नाइन्टी टू एंड फाइनली टू बेलूर इन एटीन नाइन्टी एट वंस अ डेवोटी केम टू लाटू महाराज एंड आस्ट हिम नॉट टू बैग फॉर आर्म्स एनी मोर बट अलाउ द हाउस होल्डर डिसाइपल्स टू सप्लाई हिज नीड्स एट फर्स्ट लाटू महाराज ऑब्जेक्टेड सेइंग दैट इट वॉज पार्ट ऑफ द मंग्स वे ऑफ लाइफ टू बैग फॉर हिज फूड But when he found out that his brother disciple Swami Brahmananda had encouraged the devotee to ask this of him, he relented. From then on, he accepted service from the devotees, but never anything more than was absolutely needed. Once Girish Chandra Ghosh remarked to a devotee, "If you want to see a monk such as the Gita describes, go and see Latu." The devotee did not know what Girish meant. Girish said, "I see you have not read the second chapter of the Gita. The nature of a man of steady wisdom is described there. You can see all those qualities exemplified in Latu's character, fifty-four two, twenty-seven. Quote from the Gita: When a man completely casts off all the desires of the mind, his self-finding satisfaction in itself alone." then he is called a man of steady wisdom he who is not perturbed by adversity who does not long for happiness who is free from attachment fear and wrath is called a man of steady wisdom to dot 55-56 a true mystic loves to live alone without any possessions and without depending on anyone except god that is why between 1893 and 1894 Latu Maharaj left the monastery and began to live on the bank of the Ganges. The following incident was narrated by an eyewitness. Latu Maharaj used to tie some dry gram chickpeas in the corner of his towel and leave it to soak in the Ganges. He would eat it after it had softened. One day, as usual, he put the gram to soak with a brick on top of it to hold it in place. it was ebb tide then he sat for meditation and became so absorbed that he did not notice when the tide had changed in the ganges the tide changes every 6 hours dot when he returned to normal consciousness he found the river at full flood tide his gram there was no way of knowing whether the cloth had been swept away he sat still what could he do When the tide had gone out again he found his piece of cloth with the gram exactly where he had placed it he picked it up and started eating 55 in later years latu maharaj would speak of these days in calcutta i used to stay on the bank of the ganges and live on puris fried bread and potato curry or fried gram one day during that time shantiram babu Premanandas brother urged me to stay with his family I told him politely you know Shanti babu I have no fixed hours for bathing eating and so on why should you trouble yourself unnecessarily because of me I am quite happy with my puris and curry from the market do you know what he said ours is such a big family and we have so many expenses that even if a pound of wheat were wasted would it be noticed and you don't need to worry they will bring your meals to your room at noon and at night and you can eat at your own convenience there will be no trouble for you or for us i didn't have the heart to say no to him dot 56 one day i was sitting rather absent mindedly on a boat loaded with straw albug bazar north calcutta The crew did not notice me and I was not aware of when the boat weighed anchor. I realized what was happening only after the boat had gone up the river some distance past Dakshineswar. I asked the boatmen to help me and they let me off the boat. On the way back to Calcutta, I stopped at the Dakshineswar temple garden. and ramlal dada fed me sumptuously dot 57 latu maharaj used to spend his days at a bathing ghat near a shiva temple and his nights on the terrace of the chandani porch at bagbazar ghat 
where he practiced japam and meditation. When someone asked him how he spent his days when it rained, Latu Maharaj replied, Well, near the ghat there used to be many empty railway cars. I would get into one. When the rain stopped, I would get out again. Once I got into a car and did not notice when it was hooked up to the engine and pulled away. The next day several porters came and asked me to leave the car. I asked them where I was and they told me I was at Chitpur. What could be done? One had to walk back to the Bagbazar Ghat. Since then I stopped taking shelter in railway cars. When it rained I would leave the terrace and take shelter in a corner of the Chandani. The police at the Chandani knew me and would not trouble me, 58 Latu Maharaj once told a devotee. Don't think that once a spiritual aspirant has experienced Samadhi, he can have it thereafter any number of times or whenever he wants it. There are many aspirants who have tasted it but once. There are many more who cannot reach it even once in a whole lifetime. The Master has given me endless grace. After making me struggle for only eight years, he graciously lifted me up to that state again. One day, I was seated on the bank of the Ganges when I saw a light coming out of the waters of the river. It grew in size until at last it filled the sky, the earth and the space between them. Inside that infinite effulgence there were numberless other lights. Looking at this, I lost myself completely. I do not know what happened next. However, when I returned from that wonderful realm, I remained in a state of ecstatic joy. What bliss! It cannot be expressed in words. The heaviness of my heart had disappeared completely. I felt that the whole world was saturated with bliss and bliss alone. 59 During his stay in Calcutta, Latu Maharaj made several pilgrimages to other parts of India. In 1895, he visited Puri, the holy place of Lord Jagannath, Krishna. In 1897, he was among the party that went with Vivekananda to Kashmir and other holy places of North and West India. Then in 1903 Latu Maharaj made a second pilgrimage to Puri. In later years he talked about the time he spent in Puri. The Lord Jagannath in Puri is a living presence in the form of a simple wooden image. He appears to each person according to his particular spiritual mood and level of attainment. I prayed to him, Lord, please show me that beautiful form of yours, which you showed to Chaitanya that made him shed profuse tears in ecstasy. What do I know of you? Please bestow your grace on me. Surrendering in this way, I stayed there and waited. Then one day he answered my prayer. When I went to take leave of Lord Jagannath, I asked for two blessings. First, that I would not have to wander here and there, but could settle in one place and plunge into meditation on the Lord, and second, that whatever I ate I would be able to digest. A devotee asked the reason for the second request and Latu Maharaj answered, Don't you understand? A month lives on alms, and thus he must maintain his body on all kinds of food taken at irregular hours. If his digestion is not good, his health will break down, and then his spiritual practices will suffer a setback. That is why I asked for such a boon, sixty with his brother monks Ramakrishna bound his young monastic disciples with love, and they always loved one another. When Latu had pneumonia at Barnagore, his brother disciples nursed him like loving mothers. Similarly, Latu Maharaj took care of them. Latu Maharaj heard from Holy Mother about Vivekananda's success in the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. Girish Ghosh said, Latu would often come to my place and listen eagerly to every word about Swamiji's triumphant activities in America. 
His attitude was like a child's, full of faith and enthusiasm. When I told him that Swamiji's speech had been considered the best, he laughed gleefully like a boy and said, It is bound to be so. Didn't the Master say that in him eighteen powers were working in their highest form? It cannot be otherwise. Can the Master's prediction be false? One day he was so beside himself with joy that he cried out, Please write to him, fear not, the Master is protecting you. 61 Vivekananda returned to Calcutta from the West on 18th February 1897. All of the disciples and devotees of Ramakrishna went to meet Swamiji at Pasukti Basu's house in Bagbazar, except for Latu Maharaj. Swamiji inquired about him and then located him in the large crowd outside the house. Later Latu Maharaj said to a devotee, When Swamiji returned from the West, some of his Western disciples were with him. Thinking Swamiji might have developed some sort of egotism at having Westerners as his disciples, I did not go to meet him. But Swamiji sought me out and talked with me. He asked me, all the others came, why didn't you come? I replied, you have Western disciples now, men and women. I wondered whether you would remember me. He caught hold of my hand and said, you are my same old brother Latu, and I am your same old brother Loren. Then I knew that he regarded us the same as before, that fame and position had not lessened his love for us. He invited me to eat with him and to sit by his side. I then had no doubt that Swamiji's mind was not tarnished by pride. Moreover, I noticed that soon after his arrival in Calcutta, he got rid of his expensive western clothes and put on a two rupee chadar, a cloth worn as a shawl, and two and a half rupee shoes as before. He threw his tremendous name and fame to the four winds. About ten days after Swamiji's arrival in Calcutta, they organized a huge meeting in the courtyard of the palace of the Raja of Shobhbazar. That was the first time that I heard Swamiji lecture. I found that his power to inspire people had increased enormously, for I saw that the audience became intensely inspired as he spoke. 62 On 1st May 1897, Vivekananda established the Ramakrishna mission at Balaram's residence in Calcutta. Latu Maharaj was present at that meeting, and he recalled, Brother Jogin told Swamiji, holding meetings, delivering lectures, philanthropic activities, these are Western ideas that only lead to development of the ego. Did the Master teach us these things? Swamiji grew very serious and said, How do you know that these are not the Master's ideas? Infinite are His ideas. Do you want to limit Him within the bounds of your narrow intellect? I will not allow that. I will break down any limitations and broadcast his liberal ideas to the world. He never asked me to preach the worship of his photograph. Meditation, prayer, and realizing his high, noble, life-giving ideals in our own lives and also transmitting these ideas to the wide world are what he taught us. 63 Latu Maharaj was a contemplative, not an active person, so one day he asked Swamiji humbly, Brother, why have you started all these activities? Won't these interfere with our meditation and prayer? Swamiji smiled at him and said, How would you understand why I am introducing all this work? You are a dumbbell. At the sight of Ka you shed tears like Prahlad, a devotee of Krishna, who remembered Lord Krishna at the sound of the first letter of his name, Ka. You are all devotees. What do you understand of this? You can only whine like babies. You think you can attain liberation through crying, that on the last day the Master will come to take you to heaven and there you will enjoy to your heart's content. And those who are studying the scriptures for knowledge, who are working to educate people in the path of righteousness and serve the diseased and distressed, 
will all go to hell because all these works are Maya. What a grand idea! That to do good to mankind is an unnecessary bother and that one cannot attain God through these troublesome activities. This is your view, isn't it? As if God-realization were very easy, you call on God and here He comes. Does God appear before the man who merely places his picture on an altar and throws a few flowers before him? Tell me that dot 64 Latu Maharaj was dumbfounded. Another brother disciple lisped a few words in continuation of Latu Maharaj's thought and got a cutting snug. Swamiji continued, Ah, what you call devotion is sentimental nonsense that only weakens man. Who cares for that kind of devotion? I have no faith in that devotion which makes a person so selfish, so busy with his personal liberation, that his heart does not feel for others. You know, one day I foolishly asked the Master for this kind of devotion and liberation, and he rebuked me and called me selfish and small-minded. Should I be misled by your words? I will work as he has told me. After this, Vivekananda burst into tears and left the room. The brother monks realized Vivekananda's greatness and why the master had made him their leader. The next day Latu Maharaj privately told Swamiji, Brother, I am a fool. Please don't take my words to heart. 65 In 1897 Latu Maharaj went on a tour of North India with Vivekananda and other monks. They visited Almora, Ambala, Amritsar, Kashmir, Lahore, Dehradun, Delhi, Alwar, Khetri, and Jaipur. Latu Maharaj later narrated an incident that took place in Almora. One day Swamiji saw a Muslim fakir on the street and immediately gave him two rupees. When Latu Maharaj inquired about Swamiji's charity to that stranger, he replied, That fakir once saved my life. I was lying unconscious from hunger on a road in this town, and it was he who fed me a cucumber and brought me back to consciousness. What do you think, Latu? Could I ever repay that debt with a few coins? 66 While they were in Kashmir, Swamiji rented a houseboat. The boatman and his family used one corner of the boat as their home. Latu Maharaj was not prepared for this. He was the first of the party to get onto the boat, but the moment he saw a woman on board, he jumped out again. Swamiji understood the situation, but no matter how much he tried to persuade him, Latu Maharaj insisted that he must not share a boat with a woman. At last Swamiji said, I am here with you. Dot. What is there to fear? Nothing will happen to you. Only then did Latu Maharaj agree. 67 One day Swamiji, in fun, asked the boatman's young daughter to carry a betel roll to Latu Maharaj. Latu Maharaj was surprised when he saw the girl. He immediately jumped into the icy water even though he could not swim. Swamiji, who was watching from a distance, had not anticipated such an extreme reaction. He rushed to the spot and, with the help of the boatman, pulled Latu Maharaj from the water. 68 Latu Maharaj later realized that Swamiji had played a practical joke on him. Although to a sophisticated person such behavior might seem extreme, Latu Maharaj's sincerity and simplicity caused him to live out every principle of a monk's life to its fullest degree. Another day while they were in Kashmir, Swamiji asked Latu Maharaj to buy some cooked rice and meat for him. At that time Latu Maharaj had given up eating meat. Thinking that Swamiji might insist that he should also eat meat, he said, I am happy to buy rice and meat for you, but mind you, I won't eat it myself. Swamiji told him that he did not have to buy it, but Latu Maharaj went to the shop anyway and bought the food for Swamiji. 69 During this stay, Swamiji went to visit a very ancient temple in the area. When he returned, he remarked that the temple was probably about 3000 years old. Latu Maharaj asked him how he knew this. 
It is not possible for me to explain it to you, said Swamiji jokingly. If you had had a little education, however, I might make an attempt. Latu Maharaj replied, I see. Now I understand the depth of your scholarship. It is so deep that it cannot rise to explain this to a fool like myself. This made everyone present roll with laughter. 70 Latu Maharaj recalled. One day in Delhi a man came to Swamiji and asked, Sir, I practice so much japam and meditation, but I still do not see the light. Swamiji replied, You are reciting prayers and hymns in Sanskrit without knowing the meaning, like a parrot. Instead, pray to God with real longing in your mother tongue. Then you will see the light. 71 at Khetri Latu Maharaj talked with Raja Ajit Singh, who was a disciple of Swamiji. Latu Maharaj spoke with such intelligence that the Raja had no idea that he had no formal education. In fact, he enjoyed talking to Latu Maharaj so much that he mentioned it to Swamiji. One day the Raja brought out a globe and started pointing out the various countries. Latu Maharaj had never seen a globe before. Swamiji understood the situation immediately and came forward to his brother disciple's help, giving such a turn to the conversation that the Raja could not know that Latu Maharaj had had no schooling. 72 At the beginning of 1898, Vivekananda, Latu Maharaj, and the rest of the party returned to Calcutta. Soon after this, property was purchased at 424 times God lived with them Belur on the bank of the Ganges. The headquarters of the Ramakrishna order was built here. During this period, Latu Maharaj stayed at Nilambar Babu's garden house, which was close to the new property. Brahmachari Hariparvat recalled, I saw Latu Maharaj at Nilambar Babu's garden house. At that time, Sharat Maharaj had just returned from the west and was staying at the monastery. He looked very smart and kept his room and belongings very tidy. Latu Maharaj used to go in and begin to upset the orderliness by moving a book from the desk to the bed, hiding the ink pot in the corner, and so on. It almost became a routine with him. Sharat Maharaj's bed sheet was sparkling white. Sometimes Latu Maharaj would deliberately drag his dusty feet across the clean bed and then lie down and roll on it, laughing all the time. Sharat Maharaj would ask, What are you doing, brother Latu? Latu Maharaj would laugh and say, Nothing, only testing whether you remember our old ways of life and seeing how westernized you have become. At this, Sharat Maharaj would laugh also. 73 the day before the Kali Puja celebration in November 1898, Holy Mother visited the site of the new Belur Math, blessing the grounds with her presence. Latu Maharaj reminisced that day Mother visited the Math grounds and worshipped the Master herself. Each of the disciples took the dust of her feet and then they collected it and put it in a casket. This is worshipped even today at the math. Mother was pleased to see the math premises. Observing that the pinnacles of the Dakshineswar Kali temple could be seen from there, she remarked, how nice. People coming here will see Dakshineswar too and will remember the Master's Divine Play. 74. We were all present on the consecration day, 9th December 1898, said Latu Maharaj. Brother Vivekananda carried the urn containing Sri Ramakrishna's relics to the monastery shrine on his own shoulders. He himself performed the worship, and when it was over he addressed a few words to us, Today the Master has been installed here. Brothers, let Sri Ramakrishna be our guide. He wants only three things from us, purity, simplicity and catholicity. Do not fail to live up to these three ideals. All faiths and sects must be respected and harmonized here. None should be considered subordinate to any other. 75. When a board of trustees was established 
for the Ramakrishna order early in 1901, Vivekananda asked Latu Maharaj to become one of the trustees. But Latu Maharaj refused, I don't want position or authority. Please, brother, don't get me involved. Brother Latu, Swamiji said, please obey me. Put your name down as a trustee. Don't refuse. Brahmananda also urged him to do the same, but Latu Maharaj remained firm and said, I don't want to be entangled in anything. 76. When Vivekananda left for the West in June 1899, Latu Maharaj moved to Upendra Mukherjee's Basumti Press office in Calcutta. Upendra was an ardent devotee of the Master, and he invited Latu Maharaj to stay at his place as long as he liked. Later a devotee asked, Why of all places, Maharaj, did you choose to stay at a printing press office? Latu Maharaj, what is wrong with that? It was very comfortable at night. I used to spread my blanket on the big wooden boxes which held the paper and lie down in comfort. Devotee, but it must have been noisy, Maharaj. Latu Maharaj, yes, that is true. But it didn't disturb my meditation. A few employees respected me and served me well, and Upain Babu loved me dearly. So I stayed there. Devotee, it is because you used to associate with printers that respectable people did not come to you. I have heard that they were all ruffians. Latu Maharaj, yes, I associated with them, but why should people think they were ruffians? Devotee, many of them were of bad character and were addicted to drinking and gambling. Isn't this true? Why should you keep the company of people like that? Latu Maharaj, but they were not hypocrites. 77 Latu Maharaj divided men into two categories, those who were free from any pretense and those who were hypocritical. He showed love and sympathy for simple and unostentatious people, but would keep learned hypocrites at a distance. Sometimes he would cook some food and feed the poor press workers. During the day he stayed on the bank of the Ganges and at night at the press. Once in the dead hours of night, Latu Maharaj was heard shouting at the top of his voice, Shut up, you devil! You dare to threaten me? a child of Sri Ramakrishna. Your tricks and threats are useless, be sure of that. Hearing him roaring like this, the workers in the adjacent rooms ran to where he was and found him seated in the heroic posture. This sitting posture is done by keeping the knees together, spreading the legs and resting them at the side of the hips. His eyes were fixed and blazing with vehemence. Finding him in such a terrifying mood, one of the compositors asked, Maharaj, to whom are you shouting in the dead of the night? We don't see anyone here, 78 Latu Maharaj did not reply. It is hard to guess what was going on in his mind then. It may be that he was fighting against some kind of temptation, which naturally comes to a yogi. Swami Vivekananda returned from the West on the evening of 9th December 1900, arriving in Belur Math unannounced. All the monks were overjoyed to see their beloved leader. On that particular evening Latu Maharaj was seated alone on the bank of the Ganges at Belur Math. A devotee told Latu Maharaj about Swamiji's arrival, but he did not move. Instead, he said to the devotee, why be so excited? This is a good hour for meditation. Sit down right here. Look how calm is the Ganges. Meditate. After Swamiji had finished his meal, he came to the ghat to see Latu Maharaj. They embraced each other. After exchanging a few words, Swamiji said, Latu, what's the matter? Everyone came to meet me except you. Are you annoyed with me? Why should I be annoyed? Replied Latu Maharaj. My mind wanted to be here, so I was here. I heard that you have not been staying at the monastery. How have you maintained yourself? Asked Swamiji. Latu Maharaj replied, Upain Babu helped me. 
On days when food didn't come unasked for, I used to stand near his shop. He would understand at once and give me some cons. At this Swamiji gazed upward and said, O oh Lord, bless Upain. After a few more minutes of conversation, Swamiji retired inside the monastery. Latu Maharaj remained sitting where he was and soon became absorbed in meditation. 79 Swamiji made a rule at the monastery that the monks must get up at 4 a.m. and, after washing quickly, sit down to meditate in the shrine. The next morning a bell was rung and everyone was expected to rise. Latu Maharaj said later, I didn't like the rule, so without telling anyone, I decided to leave the monastery. That morning, as I was leaving with my cloth and towel, Swamiji stopped me and asked, Where are you going? I said, To Calcutta. Why? Then I told him, You have recently returned from the West and are introducing new rules and regulations. It will not be easy for me to abide by them. I do not have that degree of control over my mind that it will quiet down to meditate when a bell is rung. Who knows when my mind might become absorbed? I have not yet reached that state. If you can do it, that is fine. Then Swamiji said, All right. You can go. But I had hardly reached the gate when he called me back and said, You don't have to observe this rule. You should do as you like. These rules are meant for the novices. I said, T. I am glad you said that. 80 Another time Latu Maharaj said, Swamiji wanted to see the monks strong and healthy, so he made a rule that everyone should do physical exercises with dumbbells. I was at the monastery then. I went to him and asked, Brother, what is this? Are we to do physical exercises at this age? That is impossible for me. Swamiji broke into laughter and did not say anything. 81. Although Latu Maharaj could not read the scriptures himself, he showed great interest in hearing them and would ask others to read to him. Swami Shuddhanandari called. I remember an occasion when I slept in the same room with Latu Maharaj. At midnight he got up and said, Sudhir, Sudhir, read the Gita. So I read the Gita to him that night. On another occasion, Latu Maharaj went with Shuddhananda to listen to a class by Pandit Shashadhar on the Katha Upanishad. The Pandit read the verse, the Purusha, no larger than a thumb, the inner self, always dwells in the hearts of men. Let a man separate him from the body with perseverance, as one separates the tender stalk from a blade of grass, 2nd March 2017. As Latu Maharaj heard this passage, he cried out repeatedly, Sudhir, the Pandit said right. He must have reached that state himself, otherwise he could not have understood that abstruse Sanskrit passage. 82 sometime in 1902 Swamiji told Latu Maharaj, Latu, what do you think? This is just the beginning. The people of Europe and America are now starting to appreciate the greatness of our master. After a couple of years, they will accept his ideas. Now they are only a handful, but later hundreds will come. Then you will understand what this Vivekananda had done. Latu Maharaj listened to Swamiji and then said quietly, Brother, have you done anything new? Haven't you walked the same path that the other great teachers have travelled, Buddha, Shankara and so on? Swamiji said, You are right, my dear Plato. I have only followed in their footsteps. Then Swamiji folded his hands and saluted the ancient teachers. 83 on 4th July 1902 Vivekananda passed away. Latu Maharaj was then at Balaram's house, but did not go to Belur Math to see Swamiji. The following morning he left Balaram's and went to Harmohan's house. No one knew what was on his mind. However, a couple of days later, 
Someone said to him, Maharaj, everyone went to Belur Math to see Swamiji except you. People made some remarks about it. With a heavy heart, Latu Maharaj replied, Let them talk. Will their talk heal my pain? They do not know how much my brother Vivekananda loved me. I will miss his great love for me. His love for me was second only to the Master's. Now he is gone. Latu Maharaj could not speak anymore. 84 It seems that the reason he did not choose to see Swamiji's body was that a terrible grief tore his heart, which he did not want to publicly display, at Balaram's house in Calcutta. Sometime in 1903 Balaram Basu's family invited Latu Maharaj to live in their house in Bagbajar, Calcutta. They kept a room on the ground floor available for monks who needed shelter and food, and from time to time some of Sri Ramakrishna's monastic disciples would stay there. At first Latu Maharaj refused the offer, saying that his hours were so irregular that he would be an inconvenience to the household. But the family insisted that having him at their house could only be a blessing, not an inconvenience, and that arrangements could be adjusted to his way of life. Latu Maharaj finally consented. He ultimately stayed at Balaram's nine years, 1903 to 1912, without a break. Although he was living in a devotee's home, he continued to lead the same austere life as before. Sister Dev Matari called, My first meeting with Latu Maharaj was in Calcutta at Balaram Babu's house. Latu Maharaj was a person of few words. He was also a person of few needs. His room bore witness to it. It lay immediately to the right of the house entrance, the door was nearly always open and as one passed, one could see the large empty space with a small thin mat on the floor, at the far end a low table for a bed, on one side a few hufted embers in an open hearth, and on them a pot of tea. I suspect that that pot of tea represented the whole of Latu Maharaj's concession to the body. 85. How does an illumined soul live in this world? Shankara says in the Vivekashudmani, sometimes he appears to be a fool, sometimes a wise man. Sometimes he seems splendid as a king. Sometimes he wanders calmly and sometimes behaves like a motionless python which waits for food to come to it. Sometimes he is honored, sometimes insulted, sometimes unknown. That is how the illumined soul lives, always absorbed in the highest bliss, verse 542. Latu Maharaj's life testifies to the validity of the scriptures. In most people's eyes, he was inactive, but in fact, he was extremely active. His mind was thinking of God almost all the time. He would spend most of the day alone, but for a little while in the mornings and evenings people could come to see him, and he would talk with them about spiritual matters. People from different walks of life, judges, doctors, teachers, learned monks and householders would come to this unlettered monk for peace and wisdom. His teachings were simple, fresh, inspiring, convincing and practical and they all came from his experience. Once a devotee asked, How can one overcome lust? Latu Maharaj replied, Keep a picture of Sri Ramakrishna with you. Whenever lustful feelings arise, you should look at the picture intently. You will find that the senses will gradually be gathered in and the mind will be freed from lust. 86. A sinner becomes sinless by associating with the holy. Once a devotee had done something wrong and was feeling very bad about it. When Latu Maharaj heard this, he called for the devotee to come and see him. He told the devotee, Look here, my son, just because you have made one or two mistakes, you should not give up your spiritual practices and brood over your lapses and feel hopeless. Tuar is human. Call on God. He will give you the strength to overcome weakness and destroy your delusion. He is the compassionate one. 
however great your sins might be, the current of His mercy will not be kept from you. How little is your sin, and yet you are so depressed. Do you know what Brother Vivekananda used to say? Don't worry about a little spot of ink on the body. It is nothing, if one bathes in. God's infinite ocean of mercy, the stains of a thousand ink spots will be washed away. So I am telling you, do not grieve. Pray unceasingly. Your bad tendencies will go away in a short time. Yet the devotee was so ashamed of his conduct that he could not raise his head. Seeing this, Latu Maharaj said, Before he commits a sin, a man's conscience fills him with shame, yet he brushes it aside. But divine law is such that after the sin is committed, shame overwhelms him again and he cannot raise his head in front of others. Even these words could not shake the devotee free from his sense of guilt. Latu Maharaj continued, What are you ashamed of, my son? The Lord has seen everything you have done. You cannot hide anything from Him. Since He knows all of it, why should you still be so melancholy? Instead, engage yourself in harder spiritual disciplines, keep the company of holy men and come here now and then. These words helped the devotee regain his mental strength and he began to practice spiritual disciplines more vigorously. 87 Once two Western women came to see Latu Maharaj at Balaram's house and discussed the humanitarian activities of the Ramakrishna mission. They were atheists, but they believed in doing good works for the benefit of humanity. Chandrasekhar Chatterjee acted as interpreter. First lady, to do good to others is life's ideal, we agree with you on this point. But you give a higher place to God than to philanthropy, and we do not agree with that. God cannot be perceived, and there is no proof of His existence. We don't understand why you want people to have faith in this unknown entity first, and then to do good to others. Latu Maharaj, those who try to serve humanity without believing in God cannot keep it up for a long time. After a while the question crops up, what shall I gain from this? And once this question arises, one begins to lose interest. Those who want to serve others will have to make personal sacrifices. You must realize that the desire to sacrifice for the sake of others cannot come unless one believes in God. Hearing this, both ladies laughed and the second one remarked, That is no explanation. Latu Maharaj, will you please tell me why you want to do philanthropic work? Second lady, we do philanthropic work because it does good to others. Latu Maharaj, but can you tell me what I shall get from it? Why should I work for the benefit of others? First lady, because we live in society, we have obligations to our fellow human beings and fulfilling those obligations is our religion. Our ideal is to alleviate suffering. Latu Maharaj, there is a higher ideal than what you have just said and that is the realization of God. Those who strive for it are heroes. To do good to others is, after all, only a social activity, it has nothing to do with God-realization. Moreover, philanthropic works may bring good to others, but what about you? Can you explain to me what benefit working for others will bring you? At this point, both of the ladies were puzzled. Latu Maharaj continued, You see, there is a loophole in your argument. All arguments are invariably fallacious. Only if you admit the existence of God does everything become meaningful. When we bring God into our lives, distinctions lessen and we feel that all people are our own. On the physical plane there is a difference between myself and others, but on the spiritual plane we are the same Satchidananda, existence consciousness, bliss absolute. From that standpoint no one can help another, one is only helping oneself. The key to our philanthropy is this. In doing good to others, 
we try to forget the apparent distinctions between ourselves and other people. The welfare of others is my welfare, that is our attitude. Who does not want his own good? If you believe in God and then serve society, you can never feel any resentment. People may get social merit through philanthropic activities, but if their egos are involved in those activities, they will not get any spiritual merit. Even the result of a good action turns into a bondage if it is done with ego. On the other hand, unselfish action destroys the bondage of action and brings liberation to humanity. 88. It is difficult to understand the moods of an illumined soul. Although his behavior may sometimes seem strange to others, there is likely to be a deeper meaning behind what he does. Latu Maharaj would sometimes appear whimsical, his moods would change without warning. One day he got the idea of brass plating Sri Ramakrishna's wooden cot, which was still in his room at Dakshineswar. He told a devotee about the idea, and the devotee agreed to finance the project. A few days later the devotee came to confirm the plans, but Latu Maharaj had changed his mind. He said, Our master could not touch metal. To brass plate the cot wouldn't be right, so let us drop the matter. 89. Although he generally scorned money, one day Latu Maharaj asked a devotee to write a letter to Abhedananda in America, asking him to send some money to pay for his cataract operation. The devotee wrote accordingly. One of Abhedananda's American devotees sent him some money. Another time Latu Maharaj decided that he wanted to own a watch, so he sent a letter to Abhedananda asking for one. Sometime later he received a package from Abhedananda with the tail of a rattlesnake enclosed in it instead of the hoped-for watch. Latu Maharaj expressed his boyish annoyance in his reply, I wanted a watch and you have sent me the tail of a rattlesnake. 91 of the qualities of a highly evolved soul is simplicity and simplicity is one of the most difficult qualities to imitate for it is spontaneous. With Latu Maharaj, as with other holy men, one never knew what response he might make or what he might say, but it would always be straight to the point. Once a devotee came to visit Latu Maharaj in Calcutta after having attended the birth anniversary festival of Sri Ramakrishna at the Belur Monastery. He came with several friends. Latu Maharaj asked him, how much did you give as an offering to the Lord in the shrine? The devotee told him what he had given. Then Latu Maharaj asked about his friends. When he heard that they had not offered anything, he smiled, Your friends want religion by bearing post. The devotee did not understand. Latu Maharaj explained that they wanted their letters to reach their destination without putting any stamps on them thus the recipient must pay the postage. The devotee remarked, Maharaj, you have coined a wonderful phrase. Latu Maharaj continued, so many people, 5,000, as reported by the devotee, took prasad at Belur Math and most of them did not donate anything. Is it good to take prasad without having offered something to the Lord? The monks do not have any money. Whatever the devotees offer to the Lord is again spent for the devotees. How much of it is used to feed a few monks? The master used to say that one should make an offering when one visits a holy place. 91. A Sanskrit poet once said that the ideal human character is as strong as a thunderbolt and as soft as a flower. Latu Maharaj's outward manner was stern and sometimes even forbidding, but once a person was allowed past that gruff exterior, he would find that inwardly the Swami was sweetness and tenderness itself. In fact, when he was in a mood to talk, he would be very free and sociable. Even children liked to be with him and would play with him, climbing on his shoulders. Once Premananda told one of Latu Maharaj's close devotees, You have nothing to fear. You have received the grace of Latu Maharaj. 
Such a loving month is rarely seen. By the very touch of the air he moves in you will be purified and blessed. 92 He was especially kind-hearted to people who were genuinely suffering. Once a drunkard came to Latu Maharaj at midnight and, in his drunken state, insisted on offering the Swami some food, so that afterwards he himself could take it as prasad. The man was rather belligerent, but Latu Maharaj quietly accepted the food and the man went away satisfied. Latu Maharaj commented, Such people want a little sympathy. Why should we not give it to them? 93. One day a devotee arrived to visit Latu Maharaj with his clothes thoroughly drenched from the rain. Latu Maharaj offered him one of his cloths to wear. The devotee was dismayed at the idea of wearing a monk's ochre cloth. But Latu Maharaj insisted, pointing out that if he fell sick from the exposure and wetness, he might not be able to work at his office and his situation would be worse than ever 94. Although many lives were changed by coming into contact with Latu Maharaj, he did not consciously accept any disciples. Latu Maharaj used to say, Do you think that one man whispers a mantram into the ear of another? and then he becomes the guru and the other fellow his disciple, and does the disciple attain illumination immediately? Is it that easy? The guru can give a lot of advice, but everything is in the hand of God, just as the lawyer says that he has pleaded his case as best he can, now everything is in the hands of the judge. 95 On another occasion he said, Do you think that a monk is your sweeper who will keep sweeping your mind for you day after day? He may clean your mind once, after that it is up to you to keep it clean. If you don't have any motivation, what can a monk do? Can a holy man erase your past impressions? Or do you think he will carry you to the Lord on his shoulders? He will show you the path, but you will have to walk it yourself. That is the only way to reach God. 96. Sometimes Latu Maharaj would teach through jokes and stories and sometimes through scolding or silence. One day a devotee said to him, Maharaj, your scoldings are like chocolate in the shape of bayonets. They are so sweet and loving. Parents scold for the good of their children. But your scoldings are sweeter still, for parents could never give us so much love. 97. In 1907, Holy Mother spent a few days at Balaram's house. One day she stopped for a minute at the door of Latu Maharaj and asked, How are you, Latu, my child? He always remembered the days at Dakshineswar when he had rendered personal service to her. Go away, he said. You are an honourable lady. Why have you come to the outer apartment to speak to me? Please go upstairs right away. I will not speak to you here. You could have sent for me, and I would have gone to see you. I am your servant, you know. Holy Mother laughed and left. Every day Holy Mother sent a little prasad for Latu Maharaj, who visited her infrequently. When Holy Mother was leaving for Jairambati, the devotees went upstairs to take the dust off her feet, but Latu Maharaj remained in his room. He began to pace back and forth and muttered, Who is mother or father to a monk? He is free from all Maya. The mother stopped in front of his room and heard him still repeating those words. She said, My child, you don't have to accept me. Latu Maharaj sprang from his room and fell at her feet, weeping without restraint. Holy Mother's eyes, too, became moist. Then Latu Maharaj began to wipe her tears with his cloth. He said, You are going to your father's house. Mother, don't weep. Sharat will bring you back. Is it proper for one to cry when one departs? Latu Maharaj's childlike simplicity, naturalness, and devotion to the mother deeply moved all those who were present. Is Latu an ordinary person? The mother once said to a monk. 
It will do you good if you live with him. 98 Latu Maharaj esteemed women greatly. He once told a group of male devotees, Some men abuse women, but you should never raise your hand against them. You do not know how much they bear, they are forbearance itself. If you abuse them, where shall they turn? They are aspects of the Divine Mother, and if the Mother is insulted, the Lord is displeased. Thus your well-being lies in making them happy. 99. It is amazing how Latu Maharaj, without ever studying Vedanta philosophy, would answer abstruse questions about Vedanta. One day Shashadhar Ganguly, a teacher from Medha, asked him, Can the Atman be an object of knowledge? Latu Maharaj, an object is something that cannot be known without the help of something else, but the Atman is self-revealing. So you cannot say the Atman is an object of knowledge. 28. Four, three, four times God lived with them Shashadhar, then why should we want to know the Atman? Latu Maharaj, because the Atman is our real nature. Shashadhar, if the Atman is our real nature, then why are we not aware of it? Latu Maharaj, listen, can anyone deviate from his real nature? If he does, it cannot be called his real nature, for it is changeable. Man's real nature is covered by a dense cloud of ignorance, and consequently he appears to be something different, but that does not mean he has deviated from his real nature. Haven't you seen those polishing shops at Mechubazar in Calcutta where they have glass jars filled with colored liquids? The metal worker takes a tarnished brass pot and dips it into a jar and instantly all the tarnish goes away and the pot starts to glitter. Then he dips it into another jar and it turns a golden color. Similarly, dip your mind in the jar of the Lord's name and all the unclean stuff will be washed away. Then dip it in the jar of the Lord's grace. You will see how beautifully your real nature will shine forth. 100 in June 1911, after a number of years of strenuous work in Madras, Ramakrishnananda fell ill and returned to Calcutta. Latu Maharaj visited him almost every day. Soon after Ramakrishnananda passed away in August, Latu Maharaj began to talk about going to Varanasi and living there for the remainder of his life. When he told this to Girish Ghosh, the latter protested, O oh Sadhu, you are going to leave Calcutta, but who will let you go? 101 Latu Maharaj dropped the idea, but took it up again after Girish's death in 1912. In October 1912, Latu Maharaj left Balaram's house for Varanasi. He never returned to Calcutta. On the eve of his departure, just before getting into a carriage, he looked intently at the room where he had stayed for so many years. Then he said, Maya, 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 and saluted the Lord. At the Havda railway station, he was met by a devotee who was extremely downcast at his departure. Latu Maharaj reassured him, Look here, my boy. Don't feel sad at my leaving. Over there flows the mother Ganges, who saves the souls of the fallen and the forlorn. Sit on her bank as often as possible. People say that the company of holy men purifies one, so does the company of mother Ganges. Meditate there, pray and count your beads. You will see, your mind and body will become purified. Whenever restlessness strikes you, go there and sit quietly, and you will find that your mind will calm down. As you watch the waves of the Ganges, the waves of your mind will be calmed. 102 At Varanasi Latu Maharaj spent the last eight years of his life in the holy city of Varanasi. He first stayed at Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama and later at different locations. As was characteristic of him, he was so often absorbed in meditation that he rarely had a fixed time for meals. Biharilal Sarkar, a district court judge of Calcutta and a staunch devotee of Latu Maharaj, visited him frequently. 
Bihari Lal wrote, There was such irregularity in his daily life that one could not say whether he was living in a city or in a forest. Today he might take his meal at 10 p.m., tomorrow at 12 midnight, and the next day at 3 a.m. His routine was very uncertain. His attendant had to be always alert for the moment when he would get up from meditation and ask for a meal to be prepared. Perhaps at 1 a.m., all of a sudden, he would start to scold no one in particular for no reason. Others might wonder, but those who lived with him knew that he was struggling to bring his mind down from a high spiritual plane. 103 A devotee who saw Latu Maharaj undergoing such spiritual practices at Varanasi once said to him, Maharaj, you have seen Sri Ramakrishna and you served him for a long time. You have practiced so much austerity on the bank of the Ganges in Calcutta. Why are you practicing such rigorous austerity now in your old age? Latu Maharaj replied, You know, merely seeing the Master and serving Him are not enough for the attainment of the highest. It is not that easy. Both self-effort and divine grace are necessary to realize God. Without self-effort how can one attain grace? You will have to work hard for even a little grace. Is it easy to hold on to the Lord's grace? Has grace a limited dimension that achieving it will make an aspirant quite forever? Grace is infinite. Who knows in how many ways He will show His grace? 104 In Varanasi, Latu Maharaj continued to teach whoever came to Him. He distributed His hard-earned spiritual treasures without reservation. A householder devotee of the Master once conveyed his love to Latu Maharaj in a letter. Latu Maharaj remarked, Is it so easy to convey love to a person? A lot of spiritual discipline is needed to be able to really transmit love. What do ordinary people know about love? Only God can truly love, and only illumined souls are really able to transmit love. On another occasion he said, your love springs from worldly attachment. Dogs play together and also fight for food among themselves. Your love is like that. You people embrace each other and exchange sweet words, but the moment someone encroaches upon your self-interest, you become angry and are ready to hit him. Don't express that kind of love. 105 One day some devotees were talking about worship. Latu Maharaj told them, Do you know what worship is? Everything belongs to the Lord, so what is there to offer to Him? But the Master used to tell us, once a rich man went to visit his orchard. He saw the gardeners busy with their work. The caretaker approached him and presented him with a ripe papaya, saying, Sir, I picked this ripe fruit for you yesterday. Please accept it. Now the owner knows that the garden, the trees, the fruit all belong to him, but won't he appreciate the love and thoughtfulness of the caretaker? Worship is like this. 106. Another devotee asked a common question, How can we love God or surrender to Him without seeing Him? Latu Maharaj answered, Don't you send your application for a job to the manager of a company without ever having seen Him? Your interview with the manager depends upon sending your application to him. You write the application thus, Sir, please appoint me for the job. I shall be extremely happy to serve you. I promise my unswerving obedience to you, and so on. And you write all this without having seen the manager, don't you? Similarly, you can send an application to the Lord. However, this application is not to be written on paper, but on the pages of one's mind, O Lord, may I never forget your name. I take refuge in you. Please assign me to your service and destroy my ego and doubts. You are my master, guru, father, mother, and all in all. I am your child. Make me your instrument. Do not delude me with your bewitching maya. O my sweet Lord, I have not seen you. I have only heard your name. 
Please make me your own. You will have to pray like this daily. Only then will He choose to bestow His grace on you. 107 Towards the end of Latu Maharaj's life, a devotee asked him, Do you feel now that the world is a burden? He answered, Look, when you dive deep into the Ganges, though there are thousands of pounds of water above you, you don't feel that weight. Similarly, if you plunge into God's creation yet still hold on to Him, you will not feel its burden. Then the world becomes a place of merriment. 108 His passing away during His last days, Latu Maharaj seemed to be gradually withdrawing from the world. He wanted to speak with people less and less, and when He spoke it was generally of higher things. His body, which had once been remarkably strong, had been gradually weakened by age and by the effects of years of intense spiritual disciplines and his indifference towards the physical world. During the last few years, he suffered from diabetes and minor physical ailments. Sometime in the last year of his life, he developed a blister on his leg. He did not take care of it properly and eventually gangrene set in. A devotee brought a doctor from Calcutta who operated on the wound and temporarily arrested the infection. The devotee stayed and nursed Latu Maharaj for a few weeks following the operation. One day, noticing an element of pride in the devotee, Latu Maharaj said to him, Although you are serving me, do not boast of it to others. Remember that one should serve God, the Guru, and the sick with great love and humility. 109 During this time, Turiyananda, who was staying at the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service at Varanasi, would often come to visit him and would sit by him silently for an hour or so. One day a devotee asked the Swami, Maharaj, why do you sit there silently like that? Latu Maharaj does not talk to you. Turiyananda replied, Latu Maharaj is almost always in deep meditation. How can he talk with me? So I sit in silence for some time and then leave. Having enjoyed his holy company, 110 Sardananda also came from Calcutta to visit him. He took the dust of Latu Maharaj's feet and then asked him, Hello, Sadhu, how are you? Latu Maharaj replied, It is troublesome to have a body. Later, another monk asked Sardananda, Maharaj, why did you make salutation to Latu Maharaj? The Swami replied, Latu Maharaj came to the Master before any of us. He is the most senior among the monastic disciples. Why shouldn't I salute him? 111 Latu Maharaj gradually severed the bonds of human relationships. Many a time the devotees heard him saying, I have given up such and such a person's maya. They did not understand what he meant. On being asked, he replied, Shall I have to carry the burdens of the devotees always? When I withdraw my mind from the world, I do not think of them. 112 Thus we see that although he did not formally accept disciples, he would share deeply in the joy and suffering of others. Latu Maharaj said one day, there are three possible relationships one can have with God, my God, I am God, and I am God's. The last one is best because it does not tempt pride. 113 Another day he spoke of Mahavir, Hanuman, the great devotee of Lord Rama, in order to test Mahavir's devotion. Rama once asked him, How do you think of me? Mahavir replied, Lord, while I identify myself with the body, I am thy servant. When I consider myself as an individual soul, I am a part of thee. And when I look upon myself as the Atman, I am one with thee. This is my firm conviction. 114 Eventually gangrene developed in the blister again. The doctors operated several times on successive days, but this time unsuccessfully, and the disease took its course. Latu Maharaj passed away in the holy city of Varanasi at 12.10 p.m. on Saturday, 24th April 1920. On 12th May 1920, Turiyananda wrote to Miss Josephine MacLeod, an American devotee of Vivekananda. 
आई एम एक्सट्रीमली सॉरी टू लेट यू नो दैट स्वामी अद्भुतानंदा लाटू महाराज इज नाउ नो मोर ही ब्रेथ हिज लास्ट ऑन द ट्वेंटी फोर्थ ऑफ एप्रिल हिज पासिंग अवे वॉज इन डीड वंडरफुल He entered a meditative state from the first moment he fell ill and remained absorbed in that state until he gave up the body. He had developed a small blister on his right ankle that developed into gangrene. All the best local medical help was requisitioned but to no avail and in 10 days he expired. He showed no signs of pain during his illness. But the wonder of all wonders was that after his death when his body was placed in a sitting position to conform with some of the funeral rites we found him looking so beautiful so serene so full of peace and bliss his face beamed with light and an intelligence unspeakable as if he were taking leave from his friends for the last time with an exhortation of affectionate benediction really it was a sight for the gods to see we chanted the name of the lord for 3 hours and then took his body decorated with flower garlands sandalpaste etc in procession to the ganges side and carried it to manikarnika by boat to be immersed in the holy water of the mother ganges after due performance of the last rites necessary for the occasion of jala water samadhi latu maharaj entered into eternal peace and another son of shri ramakrishna joins him making us feel poorer for this irreparable loss indeed we have lost a spiritual giant in the person of latu maharaj whose illiteracy and unsophisticated life helped him most to become what he was a genuine and ardent devotee of shri ramakrishna dot 115 at the threshold of latu's spiritual life the master had said to him pointing to himself here god alone exists do not forget this how can i forget someone who loves me so much answered latu.116 he did not forget throughout his life his mind was filled with the thoughts of shri ramakrishna and he would sometimes reveal to others the substance of these thoughts latu maharaj completely fulfilled the name adbhutananda one who enjoys the wonderful bliss of brahman mishlet wrote in the bible of humanity man must rest get his breath refresh himself at the great living wells which keep the freshness of the eternal swami adbhutananda was one such fountain head of spirituality